AC is one of the most important stats that exists in Baldur's Gate. By stacking it, you can basically become unkillable by having enemies miss all their attacks. But what if the enemies couldn't miss you? Can you beat Baldur's Gate 3 without dodging a single attack? Let us find out, shall we? Before we begin, some quick rules for the challenge. Since this would be too easy to do normally, I will be doing the entire playthrough in honor mode with just one character. I will allow myself to have temporary allies as long as they do not appear below my portrait as a standalone second character. Equipping any armor is also fine since every enemy is going to have a plus 99 to their attack roll, completely nullifying the point of AC anyways. With that out of the way, let us begin. Out of every race available, I decide to go for Gnome of all things. With zero AC, we might not be able to dodge any attack rolls, but we can still save things. So using the innate advantage the Gnomes get on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws is very very good. Proficiency in history checks does not really do anything, and we are eventually going to get to speak with animals anyways. So we go for Deep Gnome, for advantage on stealth checks and 24 meter dark vision. Now as for our starting class, since we cannot dodge anything, we immediately need to take as little damage as possible. So Barbarian, for the resistance to physical damage, seems like the only logical choice. As for attributes, I start 16 strength and 16 constitution. The AC we normally would get from dex won't matter, but it's still really nice for the initiation bonus. We leave intelligence at 8, as there won't be any int saving throws for a while. We start our adventure by getting us, and meet up with Lazel. Lazel accidentally falls off a cliff and I free Shadowheart, who is going to help us with one thing before leaving. We approach the helm and fail the first command. Second one works, and just like that we acquire the Ever Burned Blade, a huge damage bonus early on. I walk over to the transponder, as I said, I use the transponder and grant Shadowheart a merciful death. I ambush these intellect devourers and almost get one shot before we're getting level 2. Here we get the other reason why Barbarian is so insane. Since no enemy is going to miss us anyways, we might as well just reckless attack every single turn for the free advantage. We murder Asterion for some nice new drip, kill a Mind Flayer, and leave Gale to die. I get the free XP from these two raiders before approaching the grove. And whilst my allies here actually can miss, the enemies still cannot. I get a nice crit on this goblin boss, but this still does not save Ramira or Will, who both perish. Thank you so much to everyone who has subscribed this past month. If you like my content and would like to see my upcoming videos, why not give it a go yourself? It's free and you can always just unsubscribe later. Sorry for the interruption, let's continue. Now that we made it to the grove, I quickly head over to Ethel. She sells 3 elixir of hill giant strength every single long rest. This means that we can easily push our strength all the way up to 21 as soon as we find withers. I grab this hidden amulet with lesser restoration, might come in handy later, and grab the parasite from the grove. I surprise this bugbear and this is the first fight that's going to showcase just how sketchy this challenge actually gets. I start off by bleeding him and he hits me back for a casual 14 damage. I low roll the next hit, and he hits me for another 14. Now granted I did not rage here, cause I am very very greedy, but Jesus Christ we need to get better defenses. Raphael shows up, and after shooing him away, we get this very nice amulet that will grant us free guidance whenever we need it. Really useful since our charisma is so low. I kill some goblins in a cave, and get level 3. For now we're going to go with Berserker for Frenzy. Frenzy lets us attack or throw as a bonus action, kind of giving us a scuffed version of extra attack already. I talk to a mirror, find a friend called Shovel, and steal the necromancy of Thay. By turning into a draw, we are free to completely walk past the goblins, both in the blighted village and in the goblin camp. We make sure to pick up the returning pike here, and go back to get the ring of flinging. And no, don't worry, this won't be the 100th throw build you see, it's just like this for now since there's nothing better available. We get the option of absorbing our parasites that we got from the grove and some owlbear people, and take favorable beginnings, probably the best elithid power, and also luck of the far realms. I ambush these gnolls and immediately gets soul numbered, disabling the whole reason why I picked Berserker in the first place. We kill one and frighten the other with Shovel, who just barely gets away. I manage to save the second soul offering, but the ranged gnolls are still extremely scary. It first hits me for 8 damage, through rage by the way, and then for another 13 damage. I crit miss my first attack, but get saved by a crit right after. Shovel kills the gnoll, and we just barely make it out alive yet again. Jesus Christ, I should be dead long ago. 
Teasing these newborn gnolls, I accidentally get shovel killed. Rest in peace, bro, you did your part. I approach some paladins who tell me to go murder a devil. Of course I oblige, and after a very epic enemy battle, we come out victorious. I trade the head for his sword, and after completely blocking off the exit, I attack the trader outside. She fails a hold person, and dies the turn after, whilst the others have to run around the long way. Anders can't really put up much of a fight without his sword, and the archer really isn't that scary either. We head over to the goblin camp and free Halson. After killing the two children running to get help, this fight becomes a breeze, even with the two wargs let loose. Halson just tanks everything for us, and I'm able to kill them all from a safe distance. This gives us level 4 and the choice of a feat. Here, we can pick a lot of things. Alert is very good just to be able to always act first and get our rage off. Heavy Armor Master would be ideal if we could actually wear it. And Savage Attacker is really strong just for the guaranteed bonus damage on basically every single attack. I, however, decide that Great Weapon Master is the way to go. It gives us a flat plus 10 damage on every single attack at the cost of minus 5 to rolls. But since we have advantage anyways, it doesn't affect us that badly. It also lets us hit using a bonus action anytime we crit or kill an enemy in a turn. Dealing with the goblin camp, I decide that the most thematic approach for a run like this would be bringing Halson with me and straight up just walking in to murder everyone head on. We get to immediately see the strength of the plus 10 damage as I annihilate these poor goblins. Now it's time to deal with the goblin leaders, starting with Glut. I get a very nice cleave and tank two ray of sicknesses to the face. One goblin manages to get away and call for reinforcements. Halson is still with us, continuing to tank almost all the damage for me. After chasing around this bowwoman and almost dying, I manage to end Glut, and Halson takes care of the rest. Next up is Minthara. She does not have a whole horde of goblins protecting her, but she still hits extremely hard. Having Halson by my side almost makes it trivial though, as he can tank more than 90 damage per fight. Minthara goes down, and we use the two Parasites for Ability Drain. A very useful skill that removes one strength from every enemy we attack once per turn. Lastly, we approach Draw Ragslin, who starts off with a very normal 17 damage. With Halson's help, we destroy a Goblin, and I leave him to fend for himself. He tanks a lot, but is now all out of bear transformations. So sadly, I have to leave him behind as he gets killed. By cutting backwards, I manage to take out Ragslin without him being able to fight back and the rest follow suit. We almost die shooting this cage that somehow explodes mid-air. The explosions don't end there though, as whilst collecting all these bombs from the bomb room, I accidentally hit one of them. How in the actual fuck am I still alive? I persuade a troll that I'm supposed to be here, first try of course, and collect the amulet of Misty Step. With that, we head into the Underdark, time an attack on this Minotaur to get its experience, and fail two rolls on Falar Alul. I take the advice of this comment, thank you so much for commenting by the way, and shoot this petrified drow across this ravine. This triggers the fight, making me surprised. Because I was far enough away, it does not actually anger the spectator. I definitely don't almost die to some mushrooms and make it to the mushroom colony. Here we save a dying gnome and get the boots of speed she found. These give us click heals, a very good way of closing the distance to some enemies and definitely the best option for us right now. By this point I have grown tired of almost dying, so it's time for some upgrades. We start by somehow succeeding a 20 check and convincing these ogres in the blighted village to give me their war horn, letting me spawn them into any fight in act 1 of my choice. It is reflex time and after changing my attributes to this for the hill giant strength, I swap over to the wild heart subclass with Bearheart in mind. Bearheart changes our rage to not only make us resistant to physical damage, but all other damage too, apart from psychic damage. I save Ethel from some evil men, we do still want to make sure she's around to supply our giant drinking habits after all, and move over to the mountain pass, ignoring this massive warning sign. Approaching the monastery, I realized that using a fire sword against drunk people might not be the best idea. After the most intense kobold fight to date, and I mean it, almost died to these stupid lizardmen. We use Scratch to lure out the rest, and receive the most important level yet, level 5. Not only does it fix our serious lack of movement speed from being a gnome, but it also doubles our damage each turn, with extra attack. Another thing that helps us with our horrible movement is this haste helmet that I forgot to break out of the chest from the Blighted Village. What we are looking for is still ahead, so I continue on to the crash. By transforming into a Gift Yankee, we can completely skip the persuasion check here and just walk in. 
I show the artifact to this lady, and she orders us to go to the Inquisitor's Chambers. That's just where I wanted to go anyways. The Gith leader is not someone we can mess with yet, especially not with this insane legendary action of his. But as it turns out, we don't really have to. We can simply sneak past this dialogue zone by jumping to the side here and collect the weapon we were here for all along, the Skin Burster. Its passive gives us two Force Conduit charges anytime we do damage to an enemy. These stack up to a maximum of seven, reducing physical damage by one for each one remaining. This means that combined with our rage, we now simply cannot get damaged by physical attacks doing anything less than 15 damage. So something like this fight outside the Goblin Camp gets completely trivial. I save a trapped dwarf for the gloves of uninhibited Kushigo. It's nothing great, but better than the trash we were currently using. Killing some guy called Philro and his hook horror friend. I see this very interesting looking rubbling pile. After approaching it, I get knocked down and cannot move at all. Huh. I don't really feel like resetting this entire playthrough, so I hit the off switch on my PC. Sure hope the footage after this does not get corrupted. Oh, look at that. Somehow we skipped the Dwergar fight next to the Mushroom Village. How weird. Anyways, we're in the Grimforge now. I convince some wild beasts to go fight their masters, and we get to see the power of Force Conduit in full action. We cheese a few mimics, and Missy step over to the Splint Mold. It's time for Flind. I immediately get paralyzed, but it's only for one turn, so it doesn't actually do anything. I get two lucky crits on Flint and save a soul offering. And after killing the Null Fang, we get to see an interaction that sometimes happens in this game when you have too much physical damage reduction. The enemies just simply pass their turn. I think it is because the AI doesn't see a point in hitting you if they can't actually do any damage, but I mean, it could be anything. So this fight is now just a 1v1 with Flint, and she doesn't stand a chance. I fail to make these people give me their shipment willingly, so I'm forced to resort into killing them. We pick up the Parasite from Flind and unlock Shield of Thralls for that very nice free temporary HP. Lockpicking this chest, we find an Iron Flask. It will come in very handy later down the line. Halson shows up dead in camp now, and he's nice and toasty for some reason. I return to the Grove and can't be bothered to do Kaga's quest, so I just murder her for a really nice amulet. Every time we are healed, it gives our weapon a free 1d6 poison damage. Because I wasted so much time going to the crash, Joaquin's rest has already burned down, the door is not even here, and Floric is just dead on the top floor. So since I cannot get the XP from the normal quest, I resort to violence. I summon Scratch to walk into this shed, so I don't have to pass a check to not die, and after convincing their leader I mean no harm, I immediately attack them. She ensnares me, and this man crit misses a bottle. He must have gotten pretty mad about it, as he blows himself up alongside his two other friends. The Arcane Tower comes next. Just like you guys told me, I read this book on the third floor before approaching Bernard. This lets me tell him about a passage from this book, and he simply gives me the light ring letting me enter the basement. This only gives us the XP from Bernard himself though, and not his other friends around him, so fighting them is still a good idea. Bernard's legendary action isn't actually anything that scary, it just lets him shoot a tiny bit of lightning damage at us once per turn. Since he positions himself right over here, after talking, I start to fight by shoving him off using a gust of wind scroll, and quickly hit one of the animated armors to start the fight. The armors are actually very weak, and can barely do any damage to me, even with no more than 3 force conduit charges. After 3 turns, Bernard finally manages to return up. His discharge aura makes all constructs next to him do an additional 3 to 8 lightning damage each turn, actually allowing them to damage me. But it has a duration of 3, and since he used it 2 turns ago, it's almost run out. I kill a construct. Hit Bernard, who more so just helps me than harm me with his leaping static. Bernard's aura ends, stunning him giving me two rounds to wail on him, resulting in him killing himself to force conduit the turn after. The final armors give me enough XP for level 6, allowing us to pick up the stallion aspect. It will give us temporary HP equal to two times our barbarian level anytime we dash. This also works outside of combat by going into turn-based mode. 
Another cool thing that this lets us do is summon Scratch and use Volatile Shield on him for a portable AoE stun. There's also a stool here that I destroy, which drops a weapon. That sets the strength of the character using it to 19. Not useful for us this run, but very good on certain characters. Time to murder some spiders. After chasing this one around for 6 turns straight, I get to go after the spider matriarch. Her legendary action allows her to entomb an enemy in a glob of web that stuns them and ends by doing an insane 8 to 80 poison damage. She can cast this once per turn anytime another spider is attacked. So we can't go for her offspring at all anytime she's in line of sight. I start by prep shooting these webs so they will go down to a single arrow and begin the fight by making her fall. She falls below half health during her first turn, which might have been a mistake as she gets to use Spider Queen's Wrath immediately, granting her another attack, two bonus strength, and resistance to all physical damage. I kill one of the smaller spiders, as it's far enough away to not trigger the legendary action. The Matriarch deals 18 damage to us, but loves standing on these webs for some reason. So after tanking some hits from these smaller spiders, we destroy the web below the spider lady yet again, proning her letting me kill a few more spiderlings. Since she is now stuck below, I am free to kill as many as I want, as the attack cannot hit me while I am out of sight. For some reason she wastes even more turns, letting me kill all her children, before finally going up to attack me. I get in some decent damage, and she goes and spawns in even more spiderlings. After a final round of getting beat up by the small spiders, I make sure to kill her using my own weapon and not fall damage, as sometimes fall damage can cause enemies that die to not grant any XP at all. We pick up the Dark Amethyst and insert it into the necromancy we found earlier. By reading it, we get a permanent buff to all our ability checks and wisdom saving throws. It doesn't really matter if you fail the saving throws or not, as you can always just remove the curse with, well, remove curse. Bullet bullies me a bit, and I fail a roll forcing me to kill some cultists. They yet again just cannot damage me at all. Man, does stacking damage reduction feel good. Bullet returns and starts some beef with these minotaurs, which is absolutely perfect. The minotaur charges nothing, and Bullet is about as useful as per usual. Embarrassed, he leaves us alone, and this fight turns into a head-on punch battle to the death. I somehow crit miss this Minotaur with advantage, that's a 1 in 400 by the way, before finishing them off. The Spectator is next. I get in 3 really nice hits and save a Fear Ray. After just saving one more Drow, the Spectator kills himself on opportunity attacks, and the Drow, who aren't satisfied with me freeing them, follow him. Bullet shows up yet again, and I get to use the cool scratch tech for the first time. On his corpse, we find the Blood Guzzler's Garb, giving us a stack of wrath every single time we take damage. Sometimes, this bugs out and doesn't give us one, but it's still really really strong, as it gives us up to 7 damage to weapon attacks. Returning to Umilum, we buy a Psychic Resistance Potion for when we have to tackle the Gith Crash eventually. Now we get to take care of Nier, I start the fight with the Dwergar before freeing him. And after killing the Mind Masters and this mage, the rest just do physical damage, easily negated by all our defenses. I get to use this very cool trick that one of you told me about that lets me find invisible people by pinging their portraits to finish off the fight. We blow up the rock and let Nier out. His legendary action lets him cast Psionic Visage, giving him immunity to physical damage for 3 attacks every turn and causing them to detonate for psychic damage every time he is attacked. The thing about these though is that they only last for a single turn, so we can just hit him once and then pass. Thanks to our massive defenses we easily outlast him and take him out. I remove his head and collect the Disintegrating Nightwalkers. These shoes will be crucial as soon as we get into Act 2. I kill a few surprisingly strong slimes and head up to meet the gnome Philomene. She has a giant barrel of rune powder and after a bit of persuasion, she says that she can part from a tiny vial of it. I want it all though, so after the dialogue ends, I stop her from leaving and kill her on her way out. On her corpse we find the rune powder barrel that deals an insane 50 to 120 force damage. We head back to Ethel's paradise, then hit one of the sheep. This proves to be a massive mistake though, as he has hold person. I managed to save it after my first turn, 
but it still lets them get some insane damage in on me. Luckily, the hold person guy wastes his turn dashing, and the multi-strike guy just passes his turn. He tries getting me again, but thanks to the advantage granting by the known traits, we save it. This guy just does not run out of them though, so he gets me again. Thankfully, the two melee damage dealers are already dead, so it doesn't really result in anything. I buy a final three strength pots from Ethel before attacking her, revealing her true hag form. We follow Ethel down into her basement, where we kill some masked servants, and jump past all her traps. I use an invisibility scroll to pass the normal dialogue check and reveal Ethel with Volo's eye before freeing Marina. Not feeling like losing my attack during the first turn of the fight, I just end the invis in front of Ethel and the fight begins. Ethel's legendary action lets her summon more copies of herself anytime a spell is cast, but since we're not a spellcaster, it won't actually affect us at all. Ethel's clones always use hold person on their second turn, so it's very important for us to make sure that we take them all out before then. I use a potion of speed and shoot three clones before approaching Ethel as she absolutely loves running into opportunity attacks. Ethel wastes the turn transforming into a copy of Mirina. Hmm, I wonder which one's the real one. With all her clones dead, Ethel only uses a small damage claw attack and a vicious mockery every turn. Bringing her down to below half HP causes her to split into even more clones and go invisible. But thanks to the pink trick, I find her, and after tanking her fourth opportunity attack and getting shot by an arrow, the clones actually manage to hold person me. Very luckily it's too late for them though, as Ethel already is on 10 HP and the fight ends with Ethel begging me not to kill her. By letting her go, we get a strand of her hair, it lets us pick a stat that we want to permanently increase by 1. I pick strength here, which might not make any sense since we're using strength pots, but it will become clear why we do this soon enough. In Ethel's workshop, we find a pot that will increase our strength by 2 until next long rest, and then permanently reduce it by 1. This of course is not good to use currently, we can always use it just for the final fight. I also pick up Bitter Divorce and resurrect Mirina's husband, keeping the wand for ourselves. It gives us a spell that we can use to summon a zombie companion for 10 turns. I plan to go deal with the Gith next, but they're not even here since I already went to the crash, and I can finally yet to see what is on the other side of this bridge. Absolutely fuck all. We head back to poor dead Asterion and resurrect him since we will be needing him for something later on. Last thing left now is Grim. I get surprised by some magma methods, and after killing a few, they manage to succeed a heat metal, forcing me to drop our weapon. We can use a very cool trick here though, to equip returning pike for free simply by throwing it. Time for by far the hardest fight in Act 1. I jump over to the middle, and Grim positions himself perfectly to get squashed. I use a fly potion to reactivate the valve. I make sure to stand so that Grim will be under the forge again and he does 30 damage to me through rage. That's a 60 damage crit. I get to bonk him yet again, and this summons a bunch of methods. He's not the only one with friends though, as we finally get use of the ogre's horn. I fly back, use another haste potion, and activate the valve again. The ogres prove why they are the smartest race, and I go back into the middle to make sure that Grim doesn't run off to the side. After disengaging and pulling the lever for the third time, he is still not dead somehow. Also, I took a break here and the lava bugged out, so unfortunately we all have to look at this ugly mess instead. Lump kills himself on a method, and Grim destroys the final ogre. After yet another haste pot, a lucky crit, and tagging hits from Grim that do 50 and 32 damage respectively, we just barely manage to finish off Grim. Jesus Christ, honor mode is stressful. Finishing off, we sneak past these undead and make ourselves ready for Act 2. Thank you so much for watching. I will spare you my long blabbering this time. I'm gonna try to get Act 2 out this week. In the meantime, you can check out the one hit run I did if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, yeah. Happy New Year's, everyone. I'll see you later.